Hi friends, I'm Isaac, the children's pastor at Trebekah Community Church, and we are so glad you are joining us today to discover what God has to say for us. Each week we'll be streaming our service live from the sanctuary just for you. Come along with us as we discover who God is and what God has to say for us. The word of the Lord from John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to testify to the light. This is the testimony given to John when the Jews sent by priests and Levites from Jerusalem came to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but he confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, well then, are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for us to take to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. This took place at Bethany, uh, across from the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Ooh. A voice of one crying out. Where have I heard that before? My kids are finally at the age where we can kind of release them into the neighborhood and tell them, just come back before dark. And it is awesome. <laughs> it's such a great stage to be at. We love it. We're so grateful to be in a neighborhood where we know neighbors and we trust them. They're good folks. And I didn't know if our kids would get to grow up in a world like that. You know what I mean? I didn't even grow up like that. As a kid of the 80s and 90s, my parents didn't let us just go out and hang out in the neighborhood and come back at dark. But my dad would tell these stories about growing up on this almost mythical street in Bakersfield, California, where all of these kids just roamed the street. They owned the land. And they were told not to come in the house until it was dark. That was kind of the rule. Like, you've got to be out, play, run, sweat, do your thing, get all of your energy out, and then when it gets dark, you come home. And they knew that you still, you better be home by dark. Even though they were supposed to be out running the streets, you had to be home by dark. You get your bike in the garage, you wash up, and you get ready for dinner. Because if my dad's mom, my mima, if it got dark and they weren't home, and she had to go out into the street and shout, Robbie Dwight Songer, you get home right now. He was in trouble, right? Yeah, I mean, you're in big trouble if you stay out after dark. And, and so he knew the rule, and you got to be home by the time it gets dark. See, my kids live in a totally different world. 2023 is so different from the 1950s and 60s where my dad grew up. They grow, are growing up in a totally different world, but we are so grateful for neighbors that we know and trust. And the biggest difference for our kids today is that when it gets dark, instead of me having to go out into the street and scream my lungs off, well, now I just text the neighbor group thread. <laughs> and I say, hey, if anybody has my kids, kick them out of your house and tell them it's time to come home. And, and this is sort of the way it works. I'm, I'm grateful that we get to have this in the year 2023. Because when it gets dark, it's time to come home. A voice of one crying out. I've heard that before. Proverbs, in fact, the book of Proverbs that talks about wisdom, it describes wisdom as a voice crying out in the street. In fact, Proverbs chapter 1 says, Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares, she raises her voice. The Proverbs go on to describe wisdom as a woman calling out to people to come into her home that she's prepared for them because dinner's ready and it's time to come home. In chapter 9, it says this, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. 
She's slaughtered her animals. She's mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls and calls from the highest places in town. You that are simple, turn here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. I read this and it sounds to me like wisdom is a bit like a mom calling her children home. Saying, hey, it, it, it's time to come home. It's getting dark out there. Trust me. Dinner's on the table. And if you know what's good for you, you'll get your bike in the garage and wash up for dinner. Join the feast. Come and sit at the table. Because at this table, there is peace and there is comfort. At this table, there is nourishment and care. But you've got to come home to receive it. Now, the fool, on the other hand, somebody who is foolish and not wise, is somebody who does not recognize the call. It's one who doesn't seek wisdom out. It's like the kid who stays out way after dark and is surprised when they run into trouble. Fools don't fear the Lord. Fools, don't dis- fools despise the call of wisdom. Fools are the ones who refuse The outstretched hand of the Lord, Proverbs says, because they think that they are self-sufficient. And so they don't acknowledge their own need for wisdom. You know, there was a poll done uh, that basically was trying to assess how secure people feel about their own intelligence. And it was amazing that the people who rank their intelligence the highest were actually the ones who scored the lowest on the actual intelligence exam. We've all got a bit of foolishness in us. <laughs> like that, that's the definition of foolishness, not being able to see your own need for wisdom. A wise person is one who listens to the call to come home and the fool refuses to hear the call and stays out in the dark. John the Baptist is a voice crying out. Wisdom in Proverbs is a voice crying out. But, but I've heard this one other time in Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 40, we we read the prophet announcing to these exiles living in Babylon. These are folks who were taken from their home, taken away from Israel, Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was decimated by the Babylonians and drug off to live in this foreign land. The prophet is announcing to the exiles in Babylon saying, comfort, oh comfort my people, says God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. She has served her term. Her penalty is paid and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low And the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. It's, It's like the prophet is standing out in the street. It's like the prophet is standing in the street... The, the, the street that bridges Israel and Babylon. Only that street is called the wilderness. Because that literally would have been the highway that people would have had to pass through to go from exile in Babylon to Israel. And so the prophet is the one who dares to go out in the street, out in the wilderness, and cry to these exiles, it is getting real dark out there. And I know we kicked you out of the house and told you not to come home till dark, but it's time. The sun is setting. It's not safe out there. It's time to come home. You've been out long enough. John the baptizer, 400 years later. Well, he's hanging out in the wilderness. Across the Jordan, the same wilderness that his ancestors would have crossed to return from exile. The same wilderness that the ancestors would have crossed and returned home only to find it in shambles. 
where his ancestors would have had to work so hard to rebuild, to restore the promised land, to rebuild the temple and to establish synagogues and and to reset the rhythms of life of worshipers of the people of God. They would have worked so hard to set the table to feast on the wisdom of the Lord so that they once again could live in the rhythm of that wisdom and live where life could flourish. But 400 years later, the home of Israel, as hard as they've worked to restore it, is a bit of a mess. You see, now they're they're occupied by the Roman government and army, and this temple system that they worked so hard to get back up and running, well, it's turned into a cash cow that doesn't seem to protect the poor, but actually exploits the most vulnerable. And while there are so many synagogues and places where you can hear rabbis teach, it seems like very few people actually have the word of the Lord hidden in their hearts. Does this sound like a familiar place? And because of this, there were some communities in Israel who chose to live out in the desert, out in the wilderness. And they did that so that they'd be free of the temple system, so that they wouldn't have to deal with Rome. They'd be free of Roman occupation. They'd be free of of all the scandal happening in Israel, sort of like the community in Qumran. If you've heard of the desert scrolls that were found in Qumran, they were people that lived in these caves in the wilderness. And they, they went all the way out to live in the wilderness because they believed that their homeland of Israel was being run by fools. It was being run by fools. And so they would rather live out in these caves in the wilderness where they could live holy lives. They were frustrated with this system of the folks that were running the temple, fools who didn't see their need for wisdom that came from the Lord, fools that sought peace by placating the Roman army rather than dwelling in the house of the Lord, and so they chose to dwell in caves. Many New Testament scholars like Ben Witherington, A.E. Harvey, they believe that John the baptizer at one point was actually a part of the Qumran community. Isn't that incredible? So John the baptizer may have lived in one of those caves. Isn't that so cool? Like a part of this community that separated itself from the rest of Israel to try to live holy lives that John was probably, at least for a season, a part of that community living in one of those caves. But that then he would have left the Qumran community so that he could go back and preach this message, basically a message of holiness, to the people who are still living in the temple system. He goes back so he can preach his message of repentance, not only to the people that are so convinced that the temple needs to be revised, that they would go and live in caves, but also to the people that are still in the system. And he stands there in the wilderness probably just on the other side of the Jordan, but that would have put him somewhere in between Jerusalem and and Israel proper and these caves of the Qumran dwellers, the people who have left all of it behind. He'd be standing somewhere in between these two groups, preaching this message of repentance, standing between these two places, comes John to testify to the light that has come. And John is no fool. He knows that he needs to cry out. He knows that he has no wisdom on his own. He knows that he's not the one shedding the light. He's just reflecting the light. John knows who he is not. John is no fool. He is a man seeking wisdom, and that search has led him to Jesus. But he's also gathered a crowd of people who want to know who he is, who are peppering him with questions, asking, are you the Messiah? No, I am not. Are you Elijah? No, I am not. Are you the prophet? No. All of these questions really make the Pharisees seem like they might be the fools. Peppering him with questions. Finally, at their insistence, John says, listen, I am merely the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. I'm I'm standing out in the street because I can see that it's got real dark out there. And I'm saying, "Make, make straight the way. It's time for God's people to come home. 
And even though home needs a lot of fixing, it's time. So get your bike back in the garage and wash up and get ready for dinner. In 1969, 600 million people at once were watching television and viewed this image that the astronauts of Apollo 11 took of the Earth from their orbit of the moon. It was this moment in history that had never happened before where humans got to have this totally different perspective of their home. Never before had humans seen their their home like this. And all at once, 600 million people tuned in to view this earth shot from the moon. Never before had we had this vantage point of how small we are. How small the earth is in the vastness of space. Never before had we had this perspective to see all that we are not. And from this point of view, you can't really see who's got the biggest house or the nicest car. You can't see who's the strongest or the most powerful, who is weak and who is poor, who's a saint and who's a sinner. We are all just trying to live on this fragile little home. I I heard an interview with a Christian astronaut this last week on the Bible Project podcast. Jamin recommended it to me, and it is a fascinating interview. But this Christian astronaut just talking about her perspective as a Christian having visited space, and she describes Earth in this way. She says, the view of Earth I've seen from space is much like an infant placed in a hostile environment. The earth is so plump, tender, exquisite in detail, yet soft in color. It seems so fragile, hanging there amidst such intense darkness, swaddled in a thin blue blanket of atmosphere. It is so delicate, so vulnerable, and yet so protected from the harshness of space. This is our home that God made in wisdom and love. As small as this earth is, in fact, in our Wednesday night Bible study this last week, we looked at this image, and I think it was Sharon Buse who said, man, even if you were to take a pin, a tiny little point of a pin, and put it on that picture of the earth, that little tiny pinprick would still take up more space than you or I. That tiny little pinprick would take up more space. And yet it's still so easy to get lost in this world. It's so easy to get lost in thinking that we are the center of the universe, that we are self-sufficient, that we don't need God or anyone else to tell us how to do this, that we don't need God or our neighbor Or we start following after any voice that's crying out that seems to be the biggest or the strongest. We start searching for voices crying out who say, I am the best, follow me. I am the strongest. I am the only one who can save you. And we continue to search after peace by having a bigger house or a nicer car or looking for someone with more power and influence to follow. And it never really provides peace. And even though we crave the peace that can only come from dwelling in the house of the Lord, we ignore the call to come home. In foolishness, we wander off in darkness and we scorn the outstretched hand that would protect us from the harshness of space. Christmas is just one week away. Did you know that? Just one week. One week in a day. Woo! And for some of you, that means going home. In fact, we've got a lot of our congregation that are already out places visiting wherever home is for them. We always miss our college students at this point in the year. And and some of you are getting ready to head home or you're making your home ready to welcome people into it. And for many of you, man, that feels peaceful and right to be home at Christmas. 
And for some of you, well, home is not as it should be. This is a time of year that's hard and chaotic and lonely. And you don't know if you should even try to engage in a broken family system or go hide in a cave somewhere. That looks real peaceful, doesn't it? Coming home might sound nice, but the journey home is difficult, like walking through the wilderness. John cries out, prepare the way. The time has come. He's telling us that there is one who is coming, who John is not even fit to untie his sandals, but there is one who is coming, and he is the one who will bring the mountains down and who will lift up the valleys so that saint and sinner, rich and poor, righteous and wretched, strong and weak, can all walk together on an even plane so that anyone who wants to come home to the Lord can find their way. Amen. God was preparing to enter into earth to become, get this, and this is what blows my mind, to become less than a pinprick on that blue-green ball that is so delicate and vulnerable, to come as a baby, not just swaddled in swaddling clothes, but swaddled in a thin blue blanket of atmosphere, God. This is the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God in plump, tender flesh. This is the way that God has made for us. And we are invited to live in the way of Jesus, the one who became vulnerable in order to protect us. The one who became small in order to bring down the mighty. The one who became swaddled in order to save the world. Maybe you don't know where home is anymore. Right here. Amen. Here. Amen. You make me feel so at home, Jeff. But truly, this is home. You might not know where home is anymore. Maybe because of estranged family or because of a move. Maybe because you don't know where you're at home in the broader evangelical church these days. Maybe you don't know where you're at home politically anymore. Or even here in the city of Nashville, so much has changed. You couldn't even rent a cave downtown for less than 2K a month. Am I right? Where is home? Maybe you don't know where home is anymore hope today that you hear that voice crying out, that voice from out in the street, the voice of the prophet, the voice of the mother, the voice of the one who says, prepare the way. It's time. You've been out long enough. It's time to come home because the one who makes mountains low and valleys rise, he is coming Entering into this home called earth as a tiny pinprick swaddled in thin blue atmosphere. He's coming, so come home. Christ is our home. He's where we're at home. When nothing else makes sense and you're not really sure where you can hang your head and the rest of the world seems crazy and chaotic, Christ is our home. And his way of humble love is the table that's been set for us to feast at so we can live in the wisdom of the Lord that provides life. His way of humble love and self-giving generosity, his peaceable presence, if we live in Christ, live in his way, in his tender way. Feast at his table drink of his cup, sit by his holy fire, we will find peace and rest. Pastor Tim's going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. And then he's going to lead us to the table of the Lord. And as we just enter into this space, get ready for the table of the Lord and come to God in prayer, if you need to find a space of prayer to even kneel at one of these altars and ask, oh God, Would you show me the way home? It is never too late to come home.
fact, there might be many of us today who you would never guess feel lost out there in this great, big, small world who really are longing to find a way home. So you'd like to come and kneel and pray. You are so very welcome to do this. Come and sit by the holy fire where you can find peace and rest. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, you can always join us in person in our sanctuary, 1030 on Sunday mornings, live on our YouTube channel or on our sermon podcast. If you'd like to give, you can do so at trevecca.church give. All of our other resources can be found on our website. However you choose to engage, however you choose to join us, we are grateful for you and you are loved.